Hi, I'm Huey, the Comic Half Squatch and High Commander of the Blast of Stasha Comic Book Review Show on YouTube. And I support Gen X Grown Up through Patreon. You can too by going to patreon.com slash Gen X Grown Up. Gen X Grown Up is a YouTube channel website and audio podcast you're listening to right now. All made for and by people who love exploring media, games, tech, and toys of yesterday and today through the eyes of Gen Xers who refuse to grow up. Your dinner cannot just be french fries. Basically, life sucks as a grown up. Welcome back, Gen X Grown Up podcast listeners to this backtrack edition of the Gen X Grown Up podcast. I am John. Joining me as always is George. Hey, how's it going, guys? And you know Mo is here. Hey, everybody. The backtrack is, as you know, we pick a single nostalgic topic and dig in deep. You know, playing games together across the internet is more popular than ever these days. But we're going to look back on online multiplayer gaming before the internet even existed. Ooh, there was such a thing? Believe it or not, <laughs> there was. Not back according in the to my kid, but... Right, no. <laughs> <laughs> the internet, without the internet, you can't do anything. That is not true. We did it for a long time. Before we get into that, though, we have some fourth listener email, one of my favorite parts of the show. The first one is from Stu Monkey. Stu Monkey writes in with a subject line, Siri on Gen X Grown Up. What? Yeah. what? Are we on iOS now? What the hell happened? Well, we are on iTunes. I don't know if that counts, but yeah. Okay. So <laughs> here's what Stu Monkey had to say. Hey, fellas, congrats on finding someone who has the voice of Siri, Moxie, to come on the podcast and share facts. <laughs> so like, our 70s one hit wonders we had a guest on. So he says that she sounded just like the voice of Siri. Funny. <laughs> when she first started talking, I could swear it was the voice of Siri, even more so because she was talking facts behind the music. This made for a great laugh and had to share. Yeah, she, she has a very professional voice. We're, we're very happy to have Moxie on the show. In fact, better than I was. <laughs> she's better than all of us, I yeah, think. Really. And in fact, Gen X Grown Up is going to have a guest spot on her show, Your Brain on Facts, before too long. So if you have not yet checked out her show. Mo, maybe you could throw a link down in the show notes there to uh, Absolutely. Moxie's show where someone could subscribe. Yeah, Your Brain on Facts. Just search for it anywhere. Moxie has a great show and a great presentation. Anyway, Stu Monkey goes on to say, keep up the rad work. By the way, I'm with George. I'm 75 and I don't remember any of this shit except when they popped up in movies and later, referring to those 70s one-hit wonders. <laughs> oh, okay. He means he's not 75 years old. He was born in 75. Yes, right. Okay. That threw me off for a second. I was like, damn, we got some old listeners. <laughs> I knew Mo was old, but holy hell. If I'm from 75, I should say. Yes, right. It's nice that you're still getting around, Stu Monkey, at 75. We're so happy for you. <laughs> he wraps it up by saying, may the fourth be with you, Stu Monkey. Nice. Awesome. Thank you, Stu. <laughs> and we have one more fourth listener email. This is from, I think, a first-time writer. Oh. This is an email from RZ Ted, and his subject line is One Hit Wonders as hey, well. Hey, RZ Ted. And Ted says, love the episode, brought back memories of my first introduction to pop music circa 1977 honorable mentions to black betty by ram jam and ballroom blitz by sweet mm. which led inevitably to motorhead oh, as you yeah. would expect yep just keep up the good work i enjoy every episode rz ted oh, awesome thank, thank you very much. much thank you nice yeah. to hear Always from nice you to hear that. yeah oh yeah for sure hey if you would like your email right here on the show it's easy just hit us up at podcast at gen x you know we read every single one and most make the show all right are you guys ready to talk about some pre-internet multiplayer gaming absolutely Absolutely. Yeah, let me get my modem going. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's hit it. in a place that's nice. Now streaming on Hulu, John Cena and Lil Rel Howery are bringing trouble to paradise. Guys, I need you to be really cool. When have we ever not been cool? Vacation Friends 2 on Hulu. And there's more. I want some more. When you add Disney Plus to Hulu for just $2 more a month. Hallelujah! With Blackish, Deadpool 2, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And you're just telling me now? The Hulu and Disney Plus bundle. Plans starting at just $9.99 a month. All of these and more now streaming. 18 plus only. Access content from each service separately. Offer valid for eligible subscribers only. Terms apply. Let's get going then talking about online multiplayer gaming pre-internet. Now, if, mm. if you're not one of our Gen X brethren, <laughs> that might sound like an oxymoron. Like, how right. can you do those two things? <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. But believe it or not, there was a time before the internet and there was a time pre-internet but post-computers where we all were trying to do something to connect to computers and naturally games were one of those. And George, you were saying that, you know, in this current kind of environment with the, the pandemic apocalypse going on, more than ever, we're staying connected through the internet. Yeah, absolutely. 
and specifically through games, I've noticed a lot because, you know, people or other services are trying to do these things like watch together and stuff. We've even done that on our Discord channel recently where we watched a film together. Yeah. And that's all fun and that's neat and cool, but I don't think it shines any better than when it comes to video games. That was a thing that when we first grew up, it was all in the arcade, right? And then later sure. on, mm-hmm. yeah. we got home some consoles. little home console devices like your ColecoVisions, your Atari 2600, your Intellivisions, those hey. things. But they didn't really, I mean, f- unless you're talking about through some obsequious piece of cartridge weirdness that very few people had, yeah, you can connect out things. of your house, yeah. right? The only multiplayer was couch multiplayer. You were exactly. both sitting right, together right. How first. many controllers right. yeah, can yeah. plug into this thing and that's how many people can play. And if you have more, well, you're out of luck. That's that's it. Yeah. But around about the mid 80s, like when I was in high school, we started these things called BBSs, bulletin board systems. And it's not what you think of. It's not a system for putting your pictures up with thumbtacks on a cork board or anything like that. These were <laughs> actual yeah. electronic. I'm going to call them servers because that's essentially what they were. They served up content. You would find out about one of these things. You would get its phone number because you had to dial it through your telephone line, not right. Right, any kind of an auto automatic always on connection you would dial into it and once you created or were granted a user login account you could then use the services that were served up on this bbs most of them started out as simple messaging systems ways yeah. to transmit messages before email before texting yeah. any of that stuff it was like kind of like early texting really right except you had to be right yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. It, well, there was it definitely started out as messaging for for sure and then a little bit of file sharing a little bit of that mm-hmm. would happen a little you know? bit yeah well, and actually, then, a lot of it the actually. images <laughs> that would come across your screen one line at a time as you downloaded it yeah but as is the universal truth with all new technologies eventually Porn and gaming is going to find its way into that platform. <laughs> yeah. so, and both were well true. represented. Both on most were well BBS. represented. Absolutely. Yes. We're talking about the gaming part, though. <laughs> yeah, and I think from some of the first games that popped up on BBSs were the turn-taking games because that was the most logical progression. One person log in, they b- make their turn, then they log out, then the next person logs in and makes their turn yeah. in whatever that game is that they're playing against. And it each started other. just like checkers, reversey chess, mm-hmm. like obvious games. At first, they weren't really they hadn't figured out how to take advantage of the computer to play different kind of games at first but yeah i would remember i would dial up and go oh he hasn't taken his turn yet i'll log out maybe he'll log in later yeah you just say <laughs> who would dial in next to take right turn? it was all ascii based at the oh, first yeah, yeah. start yep. of it it wasn't graphical it was just you know like how do i make these combinations of keyboard characters look like this shape vaguely look that's what right. ascii is yep. yeah and mm-hmm. so i played chess that was the big one for most of the bulletin boards that i logged into chess was always there did you know just like war games would you like to play a game of chess no it was <laughs> that's why that's in that movie because it was on all these bulletin board systems and yep. it was a lot of fun they did have some multi-line somewhat real-time games that were out there sort of kind of you're right some yeah. of the bigger bbs's would eventually have uh, multiple dialing lines so rather than just one mm-hmm. phone line coming in and literally it was they called the phone company and said come install another line mm-hmm. or a third line at my house yep And so they had multiple modems on different lines and that opened the door. I remember a few of them that you could literally play at the same time that they weren't action games or, you know, kind of play Doom or anything that we'll talk about later. We had some that were kind of adventure games, you know, kind of trivia things Mm -hmm. where you had to answer questions and get the energy and you might run into another person who was also playing the game. It was rare, but when you did, for me, it was was like magic. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is this another human being in the game with me? That was so strange, but awesome. I, I just wonder too, I wanted to ask this question before we got out of this segment and we've still got a lot of stuff we can talk about but did either of you also run a bulletin board like I did back then? No, I never or did. You didn't, Mo? What about nope, you, I did. I you sure did. did. Yeah. So what did you run your bulletin board on and what was it geared toward? Yeah. So I ran two bulletin boards really through, throughout time. My first one, I ran on my Atari computer, my Atari 8-bit. Okay. Uh, and of course, those had no hard drives. So what I had, I had a stack of like five floppy drives and just wow. all the files and games lived on a whole bunch of floppies that were all online at the same time. <laughs> and that was called That Dern BBS. That was the name of it. <laughs> It. it was a joke between me and one other guy. And so we nicknamed him. I think he had a neighbor that said Dern because he didn't want to say damn. He was so pious that he didn't want to say even damn. So we called it that Dern BBS. And then later, George, when you and I were in college mm-hmm. uh, in, in, in the Star Trek Club, I ran the, the BBS for the Star Trek Club, in fact. And I ran that on my Amiga. Did we have a BBS? We sure did. I didn't remember that we had a BBS. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we did. We sure did. We, and it had all the things you talked about. It had games. It had chat boards. And for us, it was focused around science fiction. There was a mm-hmm. section for sliders. 
Wars and Babylon 5 oh, and DS9. Right. There are different areas to talk about that. Yeah. Man, yeah, that was the one thing that I loved about my bulletin board. I ran one on the Commodore 64 back when I was in middle school. Jeez. And just like you, John, didn't have a hard drive, so I had two 1541 floppy drives, <laughs> and it was called Games That People Play because I was trying to come up with SEO marketing stuff even back then yeah, when I was yeah. in middle school. I, I, think we, I think we touched on some of these topics. We did a backtrack years ago about BBS in particular. I mm-hmm. think I remember you saying it's called Games People Play, and I remember that because yeah. that's a hit song by the Alan Parsons Project. That's absolutely. How I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing that was true, you talked about those people that ran those multi-line BBSs. For us, we just had that one phone line, and I don't know that's about right. you, John, but my parents didn't want to pay for a second phone line, so it was the phone line that we used in the house and it was only in operation when my parents would allow me to you use turn it the on phone. at night you said right you yes. flipped it on in the evening yeah, yeah. so does anyone try to dial your parents pick it up and they get the tones oh yeah what the hell is this all the time yes. and then george i'm sure they're yep. pissed at you right oh yeah and that very quickly moved into a second phone line after that yeah. because they were like this is ridiculous we can't get calls at night what if something happens i'm like I tell them to dial the BBS. I don't know. What yeah, I had, I had a dedicated phone line, but basically the BBS was on when I wasn't busy using the phone line, right? So mm, it, it was right. my dial out number. And when I was bored and watching TV, I flipped it to a dial in number. But yeah, it had a dedicated line. Man, those were so much fun. But there were also like some big corporations that did these kind of things, right, John? Well, yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, you talk about BBS is what you dial into, which is is fine. But there were services that you probably heard of like CompuServe and, and mm-hmm. later yeah. and, and like uh, right. uh, Genie that you may or may not heard of. I had that one but they started to release games that were they fall in that multiplayer kind of multi people at the same time kind of thing Uh, in 84 CompuServe came out with a very popular game called Islands of Kesmai and it it used like you said scrolling text and ASCII graphics to draw maps of your location so it was like an overworld like a kind of like a like a um, Ultima or something right so Mm -hmm. you saw a map and it was and it was a roguelike it was dynamically generated and every time you went in it was a little bit different but it persisted for players you gained experience and stuff and people were straight up addicted to that. CompuServe made tons of money because people were logging in. I remember that's back when you had oh, to pay. Oh, we had to pay per yeah, hour. Pay per hour, hour right. or whatever. Yeah. And they're like, well, I got to log in to play Is- Islands of Kesmai, or they just call it Kesmai back then. Yeah. And then later, yeah. it, I mentioned in uh, in 87, a few years later, Genie, which, I, do you remember Genie? This General Electric thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I do remember that. I, I never got on CompuServe, but I was on Genie because they had the best Atari section of all of the online services, so I knew it well. Ah. And Genie stands for, I still remember this day, General Electric Network for Information Exchange. G-E-N-I-E. That's, <laughs> that's the name for it. That's what it stands for? <laughs> it yeah. is? Yeah. Did you not know that? I did that's not a, know that. That's a great acronym. I am a fountain of useless trivia from the 80s, <laughs> guaranteed. Uh, but they rolled out in 87 with a, call, a game called Air Warrior, put out by, also by Kesmai, the company that did the one for CompuServe. But it was a graphical flight simulator. Wow. On a BBS? Yeah. Yeah, believe it or not. It used wireframe and it actually, I can only imagine it was like super rudimentary. I've never seen it or played it, but it could run. It had like a back-end software you ran and you could run it on, on your Macintosh, on your Atari ST or your Amiga. So it was effectively an online game that you connected the BBS to play, but it was running graphics on your computer's horsepower, wow. not asking. You know, it's funny. I looked because I hadn't heard of Island of Kesmai, so I was looking it up. Do you know how much it cost to play that game on Back CompuServe? Then? Now, no. CompuServe itself, the, the game was free on CompuServe. Okay. But All right. CompuServe cost $4 an hour at 300 baud. Yeah. 300 baud. Or $12 an hour they if had you had a 1200 baud. It was tiered. That's yeah. right. If you're logging in, that cost them nothing extra to log in faster. But it cost uh. you more if you had a faster modem. That's stupid. So, and they processed one command every 10 seconds so they said that's about basically one and two-thirds cents per command when you played the game <laughs> one and two-thirds <laughs> cents george is making a spreadsheet right now yep <laughs> how can i get crazy. in on this i mean think how much people i mean i can just imagine how much stupid money people dropped on that game you kind of wonder how some of these companies went bankrupt i mean as much money as they were creating hand over fist for virtually no infrastructure whatsoever other than a computer and a modem i mean how are they not like all mega billionaire? Maybe they were and they just went on to do other things after they closed the companies. But yeah, probably. But still, yeah, it's crazy. I think the internet just killed them. I mean, you know, how long are you going to dial in? I mean, a lot of people are still stalwart holdouts with their AOL address, but I think most people have moved on <laughs> right. from those online services. <laughs> yeah. CompuServe combines the power of your computer with the convenience of your telephone to bring you hundreds of online services, like a complete set of encyclopedia and national news wires. It helps you decide on investments, bank, and make airline reservations, get free software, and shop in the electronic mall. CompuServe connects you with other computer owners and offers games that pit you against opponents around the country. 
Bruce Martin, host of Pit Pass Indy. Each week, I go behind the scenes of the NTT IndyCar Series and introduce our listeners to the biggest stars of IndyCar, which features the Indianapolis 500 as its cornerstone event. The men and women that compete in IndyCar may be the bravest athletes in all of sport as danger lurks around every corner. They are able to look danger in the eye without flinching. That is why the NTT IndyCar Series features the best racing on the planet. Join me every week as we talk to the stars of IndyCar, including the legends of the Indianapolis 500 on Pit Pass Indy from Evergreen Podcast. A lot of things we're talking about in the BBS era, uh, that was definitely in the very much early 80s, mid 80s, early 90s, like you were saying, sure. but it didn't start there. I mean, all the way back with like the, the pre like home computer days, I'm sure you've probably heard of MUDs, multi-user dungeons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. based on a game called MUD. Like that was the name of the first game, what the, the genre is named <laughs> after. And it started in 1978. Wow. Wow. And it's on these mainframes. Like you would go to colleges, they paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to have these giant mainframes frames and it was all the nerds with tape on their glasses coming in to play these muds i think i kind of remember seeing that kind of a thing in a documentary or something yeah it, it was like an online dungeons and dragons but the fact the computer was doing it and there wasn't a person you were dealing with i think made it it's just captivating it was new technology and that was awesome and even before that there was a version called cave very much like it in mm -hmm. 75 wow yeah. that was on these mainframes at colleges it was funny how quickly the colleges actually had to ban people from playing it because it was using yeah all because the they were taking up time because you had <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it was like a library. Like you, you couldn't check out the computer, but you could check out time on it. You had to book mm -hmm, time, mm -hmm. and they were just flooding the the registration forms to come in and play games. Like, cut it out, guys. Yeah. So <laughs> this was, computers are only for serious stuff. So yeah, we've we've learned that. It's, I mean, that goes all the way back in the seventies up through the BBS days. But man, so much progressed so quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked about the BBS stuff, and that was all very cool. But the next wave, the next mode, so to speak, of this interconnected gaming was really the multiplayer null modem games or the direct dial modem games. Mm -hmm. Those are precursors to LAN parties for sure. But essentially what you would do, let's talk about null modem cables first. So null modem <laughs> cables, you could take your modem and instead of connecting it to a phone line or whatever, they had, you know, a different port on the back of them and you could get a specific cable that crossed the wires. Yep. yep. Then you would connect it to the other modem and then they could talk to each other in sync and those two modems could then be connected to two different PCs and you could play each other within the confines of how long that cable was right so right. If the cable would stretch across the yeah. room you could be across the room but most of the time you were probably on a big long buffet table next to each other playing these games but then right around that same time john this <laughs> is where you and i came <laughs> in yep yep direct dial modem gaming where you could dial a friend's phone number and his modem would answer just like the BBS days, but it wasn't you connecting to a BBS that then you would log into a game. It was the yep. game dialing the other game. That's right. And one person would be a host and the other person would be a guest. <laughs> oh my God, did we spend hours in the same apartment complex, mind you, playing <laughs> yeah. direct dial modem games. One of my favorites of all time, John, Space War. I know. Yeah, for sure. So we were both Amiga users. Well, Space War actually was developed in 1962, designed mm -hmm. for two players on the same computer. But you're right. In the early 90s, there was a shareware version that we found. Yeah, we found it, frankly, because it was themed the after Star domain. Trek. Yeah. There, there were the ships, one of them was the Enterprise and one was like a Klingon ship, as I recall, right? right? Yep. And it's it's asteroids basically. Take asteroids, so you have that wireframe look, but they added a sun in the middle, so you have gravity. Mm -hmm. And oh, it's just two I little ships yes. yeah. flying around each other, pew, pew, shooting single pixel bullets at each other. And let me tell you how good John was at this goddamn game. If you hadn't already figured it out, <laughs> he had developed this strategy that because of where you spawned, you always spawned in the same place after you died, right? So and it was less Left and right of the screen, depending upon which character you're playing. <laughs> that, that's he where you would shoot. zoom across the screen. He used the sun's gravity to make his speed go faster, and he had his angles down and everything. So as soon as he killed me one time, the game was over because he would just keep zooming across the screen <laughs> as I spawned. Bam, bam, bam. I well, never got a chance to move. It was you over. You ought to spawn faster. It's your own damn fault. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it was like magic. I mean, the fact that now it was cool. Not, not that I was kicking your ass was magic. That was obvious. What was magic about it was we had played games together in the same room before, sure. standing in an arcade machine or sitting in front of a console or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the, the fact that like, okay, your magic technology box is plugged into my magic technology box and there's a wire running through the telephone lines. And somehow we're playing the same game on different screens with the same coordination of stuff. That was unheard of to me at the time. It's just in, in real time. It was right. fantastic. And it was, right. we knew that it was all based in sound because you could hear the modems connect to oh, each yeah. other. You know, they oh, yeah, did yeah. at the beginning. Yep. All that yep. crap, right? So you knew it was auditory that these things were, and that would just blow my mind how one modem could read another modem's audio sounds. Another and language, of course, yeah. you di- it didn't always work perfectly. If you had static in oh, your no, phone no. line, guess what? <laughs> you had static in your game if your game connected at all. And that's when George had a chance at winning if there was static on the phone right. line. Right, right. <laughs> well, and I was going to say, that was my one point of satisfaction in that game is every now and then I would just turn the modem off and John would say, hey, what happened? He would call me later on and say, oh, Did I, you? I don't know. I, I think we lost signal. <laughs> must have static in the line <laughs> <laughs> well they also i remember the uh the bane of that was call waiting when that first came around oh oh my god turn that crap off yes <laughs> disable call waiting because it would make like a tone it would, it would like do a beep in, yeah. which, which normally would tell you that somebody else is calling you but yeah. that way it totally screwed up the modem like yep. it didn't know what to do with that sound you would see on the screen some gibberish characters like oh crap somebody's dialing in you knew it yep <laughs> and there were plenty of other examples of this game one called falcon that i found on the internet from 1987 it was another flight simulator so apparently people were just jonesing to play flight simulators all the time i never got into them oh but dog fighting of course it was yeah. it was a head-to-head dog fighting simulation between two machines over a modem connection and that's 87 that predates what we found in the 90s so that's amazing yeah. it's even before that just slightly a couple of years mm-hmm. yep just a couple yeah. of years but i think one of my other favorites that i found in the list john was battle chess do you remember that yeah remember battle, I remember chess? battle chess is so that the one where when you take another piece they have actual fight they do yeah yes, yes. Yeah. yeah yeah like you pick up the pawn and kick him or something yeah. like they turn into characters right yeah now all those animations are pre-done so it's not it, they still follow the rules of chess you know right right, right. It's, you don't get to determine the outcome in the fight the attacker Unlike always Archon, wins, right. which you did. Uh-huh. Archon was one of those games where you got to determine the outcome based on the fight between the two characters, and that was a chess game as well. And there even was, we'll talk about it a little bit later on, there was an Archon game that got brought into the LAN party and all the MMO stuff later on. But man, Battle Chess, Space War, I don't know if I've ever had a more fun time in my life playing games against <laughs> somebody else not in the same room with me. Well, it was because it was new and, and novel, and, and we were playing with that technology that we were loving, right? It just, it, yeah. it, and it almost didn't cost you anything more. You already had the computer. You already had the modem. You're always doing crap with it. And the fact that it opens up a whole new avenue of something we could do back then with literally spending no more money, just like, hey, we figured out a way to do this. Wow, that was amazing. You know, that's a good point, though. We actually had to sit down and figure out how to do it through a multiple oh, yeah. amount of different resources. Oh, yeah. It's not like now where it's literally you just turn the thing on and it does it all for you. No. I, I think that's important to understand the appreciation that we have for what these things can do. It wasn't a given, and we had to work at it. Yeah. Good <laughs> yeah. Point. yeah. Genie is everything you're looking for, like computing support, databases, and live chat lines, plus award-winning games, over 200,000 downloadable files, and the coolest special interest areas around. But the best part is, you can actually get on Genie. Just call 1-800-638-9636. They'll even start you off with almost 40 bucks worth of free services. Science, 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 science. Hello, podcast fans. Want to get weird with us? Come check out the Mad Scientist podcast. We are a weekly show that looks at the history, philosophy, and hard facts behind your biggest paranormal questions. Did the government really pay for a psychic spy program? Yes. Is it true that surgery got its start in grave robbing? Yes. Can a roller coaster really kill you? <laughs> Legally, we can't say so for sure, but sometimes, yes! Join myself, Chris Cogswell, and my co-host, Marie Mayhew, as we examine the science, philosophy, and history behind the strange and unusual. All to discover what's possible and plausible versus what's, well, just made up. Check us out wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Mad Scientist Podcast. 
Gentlemen, I think it's time that we just go ahead and pull the gloves off and jump into land party gaming <laughs> no, because that's really what I think a lot of our listeners dove deep in on when it comes to multiplayer gaming across different devices. If they didn't know about the stuff we've talked about so far, they're going to relate to this, right? Yeah. Again, multiplayer gaming was not new. I mean, no, I mean no. you played on your Atari, which pretty much all of the multiplayer on Atari had to be person to person because there was no AI. We've talked about that mm-hmm. before. Right. And we had great arcade games that were literally designed to be more fun we had more people i mean one of our all-time favorites gauntlet yes oh yeah yeah you have four people crowded around a console and stuff yep yeah gauntlet was the one with you know wizard needs food badly it's the yeah. one you, you had to keep <laughs> putting right. quarters into it because it was just oh yeah ha, 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 the laugh of course right but it had four stations you could stand around it was the first game with four stations i think if i, I remember think so. correctly yeah i mean there yeah. were games that had two people playing at the same time yep. but yeah but not four and it was cooperative yeah it was really cool and talking about multiple people playing games with LAN parties. I think one of the most important things, just like that gauntlet game was the first cabinet to have four players playing it at one time, the equipment that you had to scrounge up to get a (laughs) LAN party going, because that's really what it was back then, right? We weren't rich. It's not like we went down to CompUSA or whatever store and just bought, here's 20 new PCs and here's 20 new monitors and here's whatever leftover crap somebody had. You had to haul all this crap too. Yes. (laughs) You had to carry it. Right. Yeah. And there's no flat screen monitors. You had to haul this big tube monitor. Uphill, both ways, in the snow. Yeah, in the snow. That's right. (laughs) We were chasing that gauntlet experience. We're like, well, damn, if you go to the arcade and play multiplayer in the same room, can I do something with this online kind of connected thing that we could do? And so LAN parties came out of that, which is literally LAN, local area network, meaning you're in the Mm -hmm. same area. Well, back then a LAN, you literally had to be in the same local area. And network, you came together. You had all that gear that you brought in milk crates and backpacks and satchels and bungee cords. Yep. You set it up in a big room in the basement or in the back room and it was 400 degrees in there because all these computers were venting in that right. room. Oh, it's definitely sweating. a fire hazard because you had all these outlets and extension oh, yeah. cords all over the place. Well, not oh, to yeah. mention all the Sparking Cheetos the and Mountain Dew everywhere. Mountain Dew, Dorito, <laughs> fingers on my monitor and it was horrible and it was magnificent. You know, the two pieces of equipment though that in my mind were what made LAN party gaming really possible and doable we went away from modems and we went to network interface cards, NIC cards, right? Yes. Oh, right. Token ring and all oh, that yeah. stuff. Token ring right? yeah. and then the routers between them. If we didn't have those two inventions, I don't think, you know, obviously we can't do LAN party gaming. I don't know if any of the rest of what we know now as the internet would have developed as quickly as it did, because those two inventions are really what the internet is still about today, 20, 30 years later. Once it's again, all about Nick gaming and, and porn pushing yeah. technology. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to talk about the culture, John, you know, you talked about the Doritos fingers and the Mountain Dew and everything. Yeah. The culture yeah, yeah, yeah. of people who played yeah. land party, it was almost cultish in a sense. Yeah. Every Friday night or every Sunday afternoon or whatever. And people yep. would play for hours and hours hours and God help. I, I know people who quit jobs because their schedule <laughs> interfered with their land party game schedule. Well, you're not going to haul all that crap to somebody else's house for a 10 minute gaming session. Once no. you're there and it's all set up and finally working mm-hmm. like that wasn't, right. a, that wasn't yeah, a given yeah, either. To get working, Is it yeah. all working? Did it survive the trip in my trunk first? Yeah. <laughs> and there were so many wonderful examples of the different games that you could play in that. I know one of my wife's favorite games, not for land party gaming, but just later on was Age of Empires. That was huge oh, yeah. in the land party yep. games yep uh, Star empire Wars building jedi yeah. knight that was a big one worms john you got to remember yes worms. yeah yeah the pillbox Holy game crap. where you get trajectory and velocity and all the weapons that you have yeah yeah and then of course mo i know you probably know a little game called doom i think you've heard of that <laughs> So, yeah, the funny thing was that my first experience with Doom was at my work because... At your work? Of course. Why of not? Of course, because we had <laughs> That's where the a, best computers are. <laughs> no, we had it set up. And, of course, we had, like, one of the early token ring network things set up. Mm. And at first, it was, oh, we could share files and get all this stuff. Let me tell you, we were there to like, what else all can we hours do? of the night because somebody got <laughs> Doom, stuck it on there. And I'm like, oh, and then it was, like, during work, he said, oh, watch this. And then I'm like, oh, cool, because it, it was early 3D graphics, kind of, right? Right, right. yeah. And so so then he was like, oh, you want to play? I'm like, sure. He's like, no, no, you can play at your desk. I'm like, what? What was this? I can what now? I can do what? What, what was this? <laughs> and I was playing. And then I saw him on the screen and we were shooting each other. And it was, let me tell you, I can't tell you how many hours. Was that like an epiphany moment when you finally realized that that is another person in this game, this dungeon? It was surreal. It, it took me a while to figure out that 
because the thing was not behaving like a computer, like the other person right, yeah. you were shooting at. It was like, doing what's, things. What's like, it doing? Yeah. yeah. Like, what the hell? You know, it's not like, following a you? pattern. It's doing whatever the hell it wants. <laughs> yeah. It this thing crazy. is insane. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a person. Yeah. It was almost surreal. Like you said, it was just, you couldn't believe that. It's like, oh my God, like I'm actually on a computer game with another person in real time and we're both interacting with each other. You know, that reminds me so much of an office episode. I don't know if you guys remember it, but Jim moves to another office where they're selling paper. It's oh, in they're a all playing place, games. And and he's not good playing at it. like Call of Duty and he's terrible at it. He's awful. But that's, I can see Mo in that setting <laughs> that he's describing because I didn't have an office where we did that kind of a thing, but God, I wished I had. That sounds like it would have been so much fun. Oh, it was. But which one was Mo? Like, were you the one crushing everyone or are you the one like walking into walls? I was pretty damn good at that game. Were you? Ah. <laughs> he was poning noobs left and right <laughs> circa 1992. Because the guy who showed it to me, he was the first person ever to play. I was the second person. Yeah, because we were like worried that we we're going to get in trouble, which we eventually did, but not big trouble, because yeah. the people who got us in trouble had no idea what we were doing. They just knew we were doing something we probably shouldn't be. That was about it. Right. Don't do that. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, all right. All right. You know, if you know. But yeah, it was awesome. And we played a lot by ourselves before we clued everybody else in. <laughs> You're one of those damn early adopter beta tester people that just waits for people at the spawn point. <laughs> yeah. You jerk. Yeah, here's the tip. You just whiplash around the sun, just shoot where George is going to be. <laughs> it's perfect. It works every time. <laughs> Thanks to my Atari telephone modem, my computer can call other computers and I can get information on practically anything. Look at this list. Acupuncture, adolescence, adoption, advice to the lovelorn. Everything is computerized these days. Aircraft insurance, airport delays, airline guide. You can use your Atari computer to check airline schedules, make reservations, make sure you're getting the lowest fares, even pay for your tickets. I'm not even halfway through the A's yet. Alabama Sports and News, Alaska Sports and News, annual report. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not, it's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. I don't know if it's possible to totally encapsulate the experiences that we had growing up with some of these early examples of connected non-internet gameplay, but there's no doubt that without each one of those steps that we've talked about so far in the podcast, we would not have the modern incarnation of multi- player online role-playing games whatever the hell you what is it yeah massive multi uh, i can't even say all the damn acronyms that's how big it's all become the, now the mamorpa guys the, all the, the mmos all the twitters or, yeah. all the twitters that's right. <laughs> yeah and i think so what like you have like the um what was the, the wow right the world of warcraft mm-hmm. that's still going right. on but i think it really really grabbed oh, the is. world's attention probably like in the like in the late yeah, 2000s diablo, it was huge i think was another yeah, one diablo, right, right. Yeah. yeah it's now the equivalent of gamers taking just for granted what Mo was amazed by when he first was playing Doom that like mm-hmm. yeah. everybody in the game is somebody and they have their own motivations and they're not just AI. Now there's AI in the game for you to fight against. And sometimes the play. AI is so good it's hard to tell that they're not a person. <laughs> These days, right, right? Yeah. But I mean, that is basically the evolution of what we're talking about because pre-internet, we tried to do this and we dreamed or maybe didn't dare to dream that we could do something as intricate as this. But yeah, these MMOs are Mo in his office sitting in his monochrome <laughs> monitor, you know, shooting a guy on the other side of the office, but in a huge, huge way. Yeah. Well, and I think of it too an awful lot, like when you would dial into the BBSs and you get one of those ASCII dungeon crawlers like you're talking about. Yeah. In your imagination, you saw the landscape, you saw the castle sure. or the dragon or whatever it was. Now, you don't have to imagine it. It's there in front of you. So part of me waxes nostalgic for that old way of doing it because I love the imagination that crept into it. And now yeah. you don't maybe have that as much. However, the one thing that I think is really great about these massive multiplayer online role-playing games, whoo I got it that time. You got it. You got through. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that so many of them are free to play for the most part, or at least have yeah. been. Well, to get going in for sure. Like, yeah. Guild Wars 2, World of Craft, Star yep. Wars, The Old Republic. That harkens back as well to the old BBS days. When you first logged in, BBS is 
not the CompuServes or the Genies, but BBSs themselves. Yep. The guy who's got an Atari 8-bit and six different floppy drives or the Commodore 64 <laughs> and a whole bunch of 1541s, they yep. didn't charge you for that stuff. It nope. was just there to do and have fun and enjoy each other playing these games. And I like that aspect of this modern gaming systems that are out there now. It was free for us because we were just tickled pink that anybody bothered to log into our computer. We thought that was awesome, <laughs> right. right? Yep. Now, modern MMOs, they make their money out of, you know, loot crates and they get you to, sure. to buy horse armor or whatever is the, the hot thing that's, <laughs> right? The but, feathered hat that everyone wants. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Ooh, it's $45, real currency. Oh, you got to buy gold first. You only buy gold in increments of $100. Oh, crap, right? But, yeah. <laughs> and everything's 90. They were going to monetize it. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, it's absolutely all those sorts of games that the imagination is less, but man, the visuals are so stunning now. But definitely at its core, the, the thread that runs through it is, look at this. We got this magic electronic box to talk to this magic electronic box and let two people in two different locations have a shared experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're talking about thinking, you know, nostalgia on this. One thing that I think has changed though, when we play these online games, I mean, it was competitive, but not really. That wasn't the important part. It wasn't mean spirited. You, you kind of want the other guy to do well, just a little bit worse than you. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because <laughs> you want, you were all having fun, whereas today it's gotten so competitive. You know, these online, like, it I mean, is. My, yeah. There's leagues. My you know, kids play some of these games and I try to get on some of these massive online shooting games because, you know, I figured, oh, we could share experience. Mm-hmm. I just, it was just too much. Yeah. And it's probably because I'm too old for that. But well, it's part it of like, it. But also you have other things that you have to do. You can't focus on learning those things. Yeah. And I don't mean that derogatorily. No, if, no, that's what you, what you if that's what you love, let your geek flag fly. Spend 20 <laughs> hours a day playing Halo. Great. And then you love it. It's just that I can't compete with that because I don't have the time to invest right. to right. learn all the skills that you do, right? No, we used up all our time back then when we were figuring out what equipment shoot to it up put in the truck of our car. Time. That's right. (laughs) Drive to somebody's house. (laughs) When you want to play the hottest, fastest, most advanced fighting game ever, forget everything else and play Doom 2 on your PC. No other game gives you the incredible realism, the 360-degree smooth scrolling and explosive action like Doom 2. It's easy to start playing, but it won't let you stop. Doom 2, it will consume you. Play solo against a computer, against a buddy by modem, or online in an awesome four-way deathmatch. Doom 2, playing in a PC software store near you. If there was anything in this show you'd like to learn more about, the show notes which accompany each episode are full of links to click and explore. Catch up on past episodes and get pinged every time a new one's released by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. And you know, iTunes reviews help more than you know. So if you haven't yet, please rate and review us in the iTunes app. And if you have a friend who isn't yet listening, why not? Tell them about us. They'll thank you later. You're our fourth listener, and we'd love to read your emails right here on the show. So hit us up at podcast at genxgrownup.com. And finally, Gen X Grown Up is more than just this podcast. Our YouTube channel has hundreds of videos ready for you to enjoy. Plus, you can find our entire body of work on genxgrownup.com. You know, thinking back on this really makes me want to blast George out of the sky again by finding his spawn point, <laughs> whipping around the sun. And I think you got it coming. It's been a while since I've shot it's down your little spaceship. Yeah. I'm sure there's an emulator out there that Find can... a way to resurrect that. I think I would so. love to watch that because it would crack me up. <laughs> if we get it cooking, man. It might be a Discord gaming, right? Whew. A million views of George cussing. Yeah. That's all oh, it is. Oh, God. Lose my <laughs> shit, would I not? I, oh, I literally God. would keep shooting him until he got so angry I had to stop so he wouldn't quit. That's pretty much yeah. what you had to do. Like, oh, you got me, George. Good for you. Oh, good times reminiscing. Now, that's going to wrap up this backtrack looking back on these pre-internet multiplayer games. Before we leave, I absolutely want to take a moment here, an opportunity to give our express appreciation for all of the patrons who support us financially over on Patreon. Literally taking a few bucks out of their pocket every single month to support what we do here on the podcast, over on YouTube, on the website. It really keeps gas in the tank. And I want to thank each and every one of you individually. <sighs> Chad, Shelby, Levi, Sean, Chet, Thomas, Dan, David, Stian, Marcus, Mark, Stu Monkey, Mike C, Greg L, Lee, Ben, Tony, Greg Z, Adam, Davis, Matt, Agile, Slow Mo, Dana, Jason, Blasted or Stash it, T2, Stubacca, Travis, John with an H, and Arlem. Thank you Ooh. so much. <laughs> Every single one of you, we love what you do for us. If you have not yet joined Patreon and you're interested in supporting what we do, George, tell them how they can get that done. I will be happy to. As always, all you have to do is go to genxgrownup.com slash Patreon that is not slash like you would put in a multiplayer game that is just the little slash that's, that's on slash. the keyboard that's right. a hack and slash that's a different one <laughs> you go to genxgrownup.com slash Patreon 
You sign up, you click a couple of buttons, you create an account, you pledge $1, we love you, you love us. You pledge $2, we love each other doubly as much. $3 gets you into that background content where you get to see my mullet. $5 Which you, you have to see jumps that. you into the swag levels. <laughs> and if you're not satisfied with the $5 level, we even now have some exclusive Patreon influencer levels that are available out there. They are select. We don't allow a whole bunch of people into those levels right now because we want the people who subscribe to those super to fans. have the influence super that they fans. deserve. Yep, yep. But yes, please sign up. Anything you can donate to us is a huge help and makes us feel very special and good every single time you do it. Well said, George. Man, I have had an awesome time reminiscing on these with you. We'll be back in two weeks with another Backtrack, but next week with a regular edition of our show. And until then, I am John. George, thank you so much for being here. Yes, sir. Mo, you know I appreciate you, man. Oh, man, always fun. But fourth listeners, it's you that we appreciate most of all, and we will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. See you guys. Take care, everybody. Gen X Grown Up is a member of the Evergreen Podcast family. Learn more at evergreenpodcasts.com. Unacceptable for grown ups. Your dinner cannot just be french fries. Basically, life sucks as a grown up. Um, What's up? KFC just what got happened? here. I just saw the oh, door open. Jesus I'm sorry. I, didn't know what was going I thought on. like you dropped off or something. No, 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 no. Sorry, I got distracted. He smelled KFC. Bruce Martin, host of Pit Pass Indy. Each week, I go behind the scenes of the NTT IndyCar Series and introduce our listeners to the biggest stars of IndyCar, which features the Indianapolis 500 as its cornerstone event. The men and women that compete in IndyCar may be the bravest athletes in all of sport as danger lurks around every corner. They are able to look danger in the eye without flinching. That is why the NTT IndyCar Series features the best racing on the planet. Join me every week as we talk to the stars of IndyCar, including the legends of the Indianapolis 500 on Pit Pass Indy from Evergreen Podcast.